Bon, on va commencer. Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Alors, bienvenue sur euh, la saga du glyphosate. Euh, on a voulu organiser cette conférence de presse parce que, d'une part, il y a une actualité brûlante, euh, sachant que euh, les États membres doivent... Euh, en dehors de la cacophonie française, où euh, il <rire> y avait un vote contre du ministère de l'Environnement, euh, hier matin, j'ai rencontré le ministre, M. Travers de l'Agriculture, qui m'a bien déclaré qu'ils allaient voter contre pour un renouvellement de 10 ans, mais rien sur un renouvellement de 5 ans. Donc euh, euh, tout est possible. Euh, Qu'en même temps, pour tout vous dire, le 5 et le 6, il y aura certainement un sondage, parce que je vois mal comment la Commission peut aller à un vote alors que le gouvernement allemand n'est pas constitué. Mais pourquoi on est là Parce qu'il y a un vrai dysfonctionnement sur euh, le fonctionnement de nos agences européennes, notamment de l'EFSA. Euh, vu que l'EFSA, rappelez-vous, en mars... Alors en mars 2015, on avait le cirque qui avait dit que le glyphosate était probablement cancérigène et qu'en novembre 2015, euh, l'EFSA a déclaré que ce n'était pas cancérigène. Euh, entre temps, il y a eu un procès. C'est pour ça que j'ai invité Catherine Forgy, qui est avocate des plaignants. Elle vous expliquera qu'on est à plus de 10 000 plaignants aux États-Unis. À ce procès, il y a eu une sortie de documents confidentiels qu'on appelle les Monsanto Papers. Pour nous, ces documents, c'est très important. Pourquoi Parce que entre, vous voyez, deux agences, l'OMS et l'EFSA, via d'ailleurs l'agence allemande BFR, qui a été le rapporteur pour euh, donner des informations euh, pour l'EFSA, on s'aperçoit qu'il y a une manipulation des sciences que Monsanto joue un rôle complètement incroyable, et ça, ça, ça va être quatre, euh, Carré, Gilliam et d'ailleurs Catherine qui vont vous l'évoquer, où l'EFSA, en fait, a été en dessous de tout. D'une part, et je remercie qu'il y ait le représentant de Global 2000 qui a sorti l'information comme quoi euh, il y avait des copier collés dans le rapport du BFR via l'EFSA, où les, les sources ne sont même pas mentionnées, que c'est des informations de Monsanto, vous voyez, ce n'est pas sourcé, et qu'en même temps, il y a plus de 100 pages sur les 4300 pages du rapport de l'EFSA. En même temps, au mois de juillet, c'était le CIO qui avait sorti une information comme quoi ce rapport avait été communiqué par des consultants du Glyphosate Task Force, avant qu'il soit publié définitivement pour avoir l'avis quand même, vous voyez, de, ce, de cette plateforme qui réunit tous les industriels pour leur verre au cas où il y aurait des documents confidentiels qui ne pourraient pas sortir. Donc, euh, moi j'avoue que quand je vois et que je suis pour vraiment qu'on ait une agence européenne indépendante et objective qui fasse de véritables sciences, c'est vrai qu'on va demander la démission du directeur de l'EFSA, qui s'appelle M. Hurle, euh, et qui a, pendant des années, essayé de dire « tout va très bien, Madame la Marquise », et on voit maintenant dans les dysfonctionnements que de dire que le glyphosate n'est pas cancérigène, c'est vraiment une faute, vous voyez, euh, professionnelle, une faute scientifique qui peut avoir des répercussions sur la santé de tous les citoyens européens. C'est un enjeu, et vraiment, moi, je m'implique vraiment dans ce dossier, parce que c'est un enjeu international. Pourquoi on se bagarre C'est pas que pour les santé, la santé des citoyens européens, c'est pour la santé du monde entier. S'il y a plus de 10 000 agriculteurs qui portent plainte, quand vous voyez au Brésil ce qui se passe, quand vous voyez en Argentine ce qui se passe, c'est que, vous voyez, la conséquence de ce round-up, elle est dramatique pour la santé des gens. Et puis le deuxième aspect, je vous dis, c'est... Comment se fait-il C'est la science confisquée. Comment se fait-il Et là, vous savez que le groupe des Verts a porté plainte au niveau de la Cour de justice européenne, puisque quand on a demandé à l'EFSA, mais vous avez rendu un avis scientifique, sur quelle base vous avez rendu cet avis scientifique On vous dit il y a plus de 70 études qui sont confidentielles défense, parce que ce sont les industriels qui les ont réalisées, que ça coûte des millions, et que par rapport à la directive secret d'affaires, 
on ne peut pas y avoir accès. Donc on a saisi la Cour de justice européenne pour attaquer l'EFSA, pour dire « l'EFSA, vous devez nous communiquer ces, euh, ces euh, publications ». Donc la Cour de justice européenne, il va falloir un an ou deux ans avant qu'elle acte. Mais vous voyez qu'on est dans une situation très inconfortable, puisqu'on ne peut même pas avoir accès à ces données. Euh, donc euh, je vais passer la parole euh, à d'abord Carré Gilliam, hein, qui est directeur scientifique d'une revue hein, qui s'appelle « Une ONG ». Hein euh, donc, euh, euh, elle va vous parler de, des dysfonctionnements historiques de Monsanto et du lien, justement, entre Monsanto et les différentes agences. Et ensuite, vraiment, je tiens à les remercier. Elles sont venues pour l'une de, de San Francisco et, et pour l'autre d'une autre région des États-Unis pour témoigner parce qu'il y a vraiment un lien entre le fonctionnement des États-Unis et le fonctionnement de l'Europe via, bien sûr, cette pieuvre qu'est Monsanto. Et la deuxième chose, quand même, sur laquelle je voudrais finir, c'est qu'on va demander une commission d'enquête sur ce glyphosate. Parce que si on ne crève pas l'abcès sur ce glyphosate, avec les dysfonctionnements des sciences, avec les dysfonctionnements de ces experts qui ont des conflits d'intérêts, je pense au BFR, mais il y en a aussi à l'EFSA, on ne peut pas, vous voyez, avoir des avis scientifiques objectifs. Et il faut qu'on ait les auditions, parce que rappelez-vous, il va y avoir une audition de la commission santé, environnement et consommateurs le 11 octobre, qu'on avait invité Monsanto, que Monsanto, je vous renvoie la lettre de Monsanto en disant, mais de quel droit les députés européens pourraient avoir un avis sur la reconduction du glyphosate ou pas Mais c'est quoi ce mépris si vous voulez, des parlementaires qui sont des législateurs et qui doivent justement acter de l'autorisation ou pas de substances, acte, euh, euh, de substances chimiques, et puis en même temps du bon fonctionnement de nos agences. Donc vous voyez que là, c'est un enjeu très important, et vraiment je trouve que c'est très important que vous ayez accès aussi aux témoignages de ce qui se fait aux États-Unis. Donc je vais passer la parole à Carré Gilliam, qui va présenter justement les éléments actuels de la situation. Good morning. Uh, I am Carrie Gillum. I uh, am a, a journalist. I've been a journalist for 25 years, more than 25 years. Um, I'm far more comfortable sitting where you are than sitting here, I think, but so this is still relatively new to me. Um, I spent most of my career at Reuters, uh, 17 years there. I left almost two years ago and became research director for U.S. Right to Know in the United States, which is, which is a consumer information um, and education organization. We focus on food and agriculture, and I spend most of my time filing Freedom of Information Act requests, essentially, with government agencies and with public universities, um, trying to find out what is going on behind the scenes. It's red. There, how's that? Is that better? Okay, great. So during, during my 17 years at Reuters, my primary responsibility was to cover um, Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, the other big players in food and agriculture, and learn everything I could about genetically modified seed technology, the chemical products that these companies were using, their strategies, and of course the health and environmental impacts. Um, you know, the advantages, disadvantages for farmers, et cetera. As part of that job and my job now at U.S. Right to Know, I've obtained, and U.S. Right to Know, we've obtained literally thousands of documents through freedom of information. And it's become very clear, particularly when you combine what we've obtained with the documents that have come out of the litigation, the discovery documents, which are internal Monsanto emails and reports and memos and things, that um, the history of glyphosate in particular, which is what the EU is so focused on right now, has been one of literally decades of deceptive tactics um, by Monsanto to manipulate the science, to employ uh, an army of soldiers um, in, the, in Europe and in the U.S. To, to present the science that Monsanto wants them to present and to suppress the independent and authentic science that seems to show concerns about glyphosate. 
do you want to move on? So you all are familiar, I'm sure, March 2015, International Agency for Research on Cancer came out and looked at glyphosate, looked at the research studies that had been done and declared it a probable human, human carcinogen. Um, that issue, obviously, is what uh, EU is looking at right now, and it's a very big discussion in the United States. But what we're focusing in on at, at US Right to Know is not so much whether it causes cancer, but whether or not Monsanto has been deceptive. Um, in its representation of glyphosate um, because the regulators have relied so heavily in the U.S. and in Europe upon what Monsanto has presented to them and, and their argument. Um, so you can go to the next one. So the question that I ask, you know, as a journalist, uh, and I would hope that everybody would be asking, seems obvious to me, if this is truly what Monsanto says it is, if glyphosate has 40 years of documented safety studies and there is no question and there is an international <laughs> consensus why is Monsanto employing these deceptive tactics? And the documents show very clearly that they have, that they have ghostwritten a number of uh, research review studies and other papers. And when we say ghostwrite, we mean writing, editing, um, materials that are submitted for publication in peer-reviewed journals um, that carry the names of people who look to be independent of Monsanto but are actually written and drafted and edited by Monsanto. And you see them discussing this in their internal emails and how it saves them money and it helps them. Um, the establishment of, as I said, networks of scientists, they talk very much about this. They talk very much internally about genotoxicity concerns and issues and they need to push back on that. And so they need to develop scientists in Europe who will help them defend this um, secretly so that the scientists appear to be independent when they're not actually. Um, we've had that in the United States. We have professors that we found in many, many universities um, who are receiving funding for their programs um, and going out and making presentations, writing policy papers, talking to our lawmakers, talking to regulators, all while appearing to be independent experts. And you'll even, you'll see though in the documents, a lot of times Monsanto drafts their presentations, will draft their papers, will help them prepare their slides. Um, it's <laughs> For me, it's, a, like, it's so deceptive and deceitful. I find um, hired pathologists to uh, try to reinterpret scientific studies that very clearly show dose response, glyphosate issues, rare tumors in laboratory animals, mice, and other sort of toxicology studies. Um, th this is something that we've seen over and over again. We've seen them uh, work uh, secretly behind the scenes with EPA, certain EPA officials in the United States to kill a separate review um, by a separate agency of glyphosate because they said they were so worried that that separate agency would find, like IARC found, uh, problems with glyphosate um, and trying to block a scientific review. Whenever they feel that they don't have um, enough sort of clout or influence with an agency, we see them try to block or suppress that outside review. So I wanted to give you um, one example that I wrote about recently, if you could, yeah. Yeah, so this is um, something that I found really interesting because Monsanto, of course, I was working at Reuters when the IARC um, announcement came out in March of 2015 and Monsanto reacted, you know, immediately with outrage and shock and surprise and, um, you know, IARC needed to retract uh, the decision and they wrote to the World Health Organization and they called on lawmakers to investigate and, you know, there's a movement now spurred by Monsanto and the chemical industry to defund IARC, to pull U.S. funds from IARC. Um, and you saw sort of a wave of outrage from scientists all over the United States and, and other players. But what we found through looking at these documents is that Monsanto knew and expected um, because of the epidemiology, the toxicology, they said they knew they were vulnerable. This is all months before IARC even sat down. They said they were vulnerable, they had been concerned about it for a really long time, and they needed to figure out how to fight it, what they thought was gonna happen, if you could turn. So this is another internal document before um, IARC met, where they're talking about they expect either a 2B or a 2A. They knew the science, they knew they were vulnerable, and they knew that it warranted either a 2A or a 2B. So, and then if you go on, you can see how they wanted to, yeah, go to this one. So what they decided to do was to orchestrate an outcry. 
Um, they also use the word outrage, orchestrate, create, and outrage. This is all, again, before IARC. And when you go through this document, which is their preparedness and engagement plan uh, for IARC, again, <laughs> before IARC met, um, they list, and I don't have the whole document here, but they list all the different players they're going to employ, these different organizations and individuals who look to be independent, who they're going to have, you know, write letters and do different things, um, put articles that Monsanto or Monsanto's public relations firm will write, and they will appear to be from somebody independent and put in magazines and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, you know, again, it's all, it's, it's very strategic, and it was very smart of them, but it was also very deceptive, in my view. This is, you know, again, a few examples of their efforts to influence regulators, what we've seen in the documents. Um, Ghostwriting papers, I think Catherine will talk more about that, developing the network, attacking the journalists and scientists. I know about that personally. Um, they used to be very nice to me when I started asking a lot of questions about things that didn't add up. They weren't so nice to me, but they've done this to a lot of scientists as well. I'm sure you're familiar with Seralini, obviously, but he's not the only one. Um, they've attacked, you know, I don't dozens, numerous scientists in numerous countries, pretty much anyone whose scientific research has shown problems with glyphosate. Um, and, and there are a lot. Um, there is not a scientific consensus over the, si the safety of glyphosate. Um, there is an abundance of research, which is what <coughs> led IARC to the conclusion that it came up with. Um, we also have seen just some other things. After the IARC classification, uh, Monsanto felt quite comfortable sending the EPA talking points for how, what to say to the press. It was to demonstrate to me how close um, they felt that they were. When uh, the EPA convened a scientific advisory panel to help them look at glyphosate, um, Monsanto didn't want that. They didn't want these outside experts coming in. Um, they weren't able to kill the panel, but they were able to remove one of the top epidemiologists from the panel by pressuring EPA to do that. And then one of the most sort of egregious recent things, we think, um, is the separate agency, which I alluded to earlier, the uh, ATSDR, which is part of Health and Human Services. So it's completely separate from EPA. Monsanto doesn't typically interact. It's not a regulator for Monsanto, but it was going to look at glyphosate safety in 2015. You can see from internal documents, do I have any of the, no, I don't. <laughs> anyway, you can see from internal documents that Monsanto said they were very afraid of this review. They were afraid that ATSDR would agree with IARC. They contacted three top EPA officials, um, Jim Jones, who was the uh, head of the Office of Pesticide Programs and was a political, political appointee. He's no longer there with the Trump administration changeover, but um, as a political appointee, you know, he is subject, obviously, to political pressure and lawmakers pressuring him. You saw Monsanto go directly to him and say, we need to get rid of this ATSDR. You know, and then you can see through the email communications how they work to do that for Monsanto um, and how Monsanto is very pleased that they killed that review because they were so worried about it. Let's see. European regulators, I'm running out of time, I think. But, you know, we've seen this as well um, with communications that I think Catherine will talk more about between EPA and EFSA and Monsanto wanting EPA's help to align EFSA. Um, there are some communications about BFR. Um, so it seems clear, although we don't have as much information um, as we do, I don't because I don't have the access to the documents. You know, I literally have thousands of documents from EPA. Um, but it seems pretty clear that they were very worried and working to align EFSA and BFR and others. And we know, of course, Glyphosate Task Force worked very closely, providing assessments and information to BFR that they, in many cases, just appeared to lift, cut, and paste um, and use Monsanto's own assessments. Um, and then you're probably familiar with the jumper. It's another, uh, another example, um, you know, with conflict of interest, uh, where you find out the chairman and the co-chairman are, you know, part of ILSI, which of course gets money from the chemical industry. It's just this giant octopus um, that we found that has Monsanto and the agrochemical industry literally have tentacles, you know, almost everywhere. Uh, that's what I just talked about, but you can see the ATSDR, these are just a couple examples from Monsanto memos where they're saying we're trying to do everything we can to keep from having a domestic IARC occur. 
different Monsanto executives talk about ATSDR, very conservative, IARC-like. They said publicly that this was only about trying to save government money, but they said internally that they were very concerned that they would agree with IARC. Am I out of time or should I keep going? <laughs> I'm out of time. I need to be. Okay, sorry. Well, I mean, yeah, I think Catherine will cover a lot of that, but again, we've seen the ghost writing. It, it, and it isn't only with the research studies, um, but it's in magazine articles. You know, you, you'll see it in magazine articles, you'll see it on websites. Um, they have this famous site called GMO Answers. Um, that maybe you all are familiar with or maybe you're not, but it's really to try to convince consumers that GMOs are safe and glyphosate is safe and pesticides are good for you or, you know, whatever. But um, there are no problems. And what we've seen in there is that a lot of the professors, um, particularly one, one that comes to mind, the articles carry his name and carry his bio, but were written exactly word for word by Ketchum, by our firm that works for Monsanto. Um, and this particular professor was on this website more than 70 times, putting out these, and, and never says, there's never any information that says that somebody else wrote it, that he's affiliated with Monsanto. Um, again, it's just all very deceptive. This is an email, this is a good email about ghostwriting um, that maybe you all have seen, I think it's been repeated, but where they talk about, you know, keeping the cost down by doing the writing. You know, we'll just have these independent scientists edit and sign. Any more? I mean, there's so much. Um, oh, this is, okay, this is my favorite probably. So I just mentioned this one, and you may have seen this one too. This is Academics Review. This is another example, what I said, of they set up sort of nonprofits and organizations that appear to be independent, weigh in on the science. This is one that they set up called Academics Review, and you can see in 2012 they're talking about, you know, we can pay experts. The key will be keeping Monsanto in the background so as not to harm the credibility of the information. And we've seen that over and over and over again in many different, we call them front groups. I don't know what you want to call them. They also, they have um, centers set up to uh, try to influence and manipulate journalists, science media centers. They have journalist boot camps um, to train journalists how to cover these issues and how to, how to think properly about these issues. Is there anything else? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I could talk all day about it. Je vais passer la parole à Catherine Forgy. Okay, thank you very much. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Oops. <laughs> My technical abilities are, are impressive, I'm sure. Anyway, my name is Catherine Forge. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Andrus Wagstaff in the United States, and I've been working on the Monsanto litigation uh, since the IARC uh, monograph came out. So I've been asked to specifically talk about the litigation in the U.S. and how the Monsanto papers came to be. So I'll talk about that first, and if we have time, then I'll go to my PowerPoint presentation. So when the IARC monograph came out, my specific area of expertise in the law is dealing with the medicine and the science. So the first thing I have to do is determine whether the medicine and the science is appropriate uh, to file litigation. So we reviewed uh, the monograph, the IARC monograph, when it came out in March of 2015. I met with various uh, medical experts, scientific experts, mm -hmm. and determined that indeed uh, this was probably um, an appropriate uh, place for litigation. So approximately four months after the IARC monograph came out, we filed our first lawsuit. We filed in federal court for strategic reasons. We have cases going both in federal court and in state court cases. But suffice it to say, for your purposes, the federal court cases have been consolidated in Northern California, in San Francisco, in front of one judge. And every time a uh, litig every time a case is filed in federal court, any place in the United States, it will eventually be transferred into Northern District of California and will be filed in front of our judge there. In terms of the state court cases, they will be running separately and independently, although most of the state court judges are looking to see what's happening in the federal litigation before they move forward. Okay, so after we filed the lawsuit, then we begin what's known as the discovery process in legal terms. And the discovery process uh, covers several different areas. We can ask them written questions, 
which are known as interrogatories, and then they respond to those. We can take depositions, which are when they, we go into a legal conference room and we sit down and ask questions of both Monsanto employees and Monsanto <coughs> hired experts, and it is a court reporter takes down and makes a deposition transcript of that. And the third main process for discovery is the request for documents. I think that's probably what you're most interested in, although I suggest to you that once the deposition transcripts are released, of both the experts and the Monsanto employees, that those are worth reading as well. So we make several requests to Monsanto to produce documents, and they agree to produce documents only subject to a what we call a protective order, meaning that they are entitled to stamp documents that are confidential, which is supposed to be trade secrets and proprietary secrets only. But in fact, what Monsanto did was they stamped almost every single document confidential. So what that means as a practical matter for us is that we have to go back to the court, back to our judge, in a lengthy, time-consuming, expensive process to get those documents decertified so that we can share them. I, I am sure that this was part of Monsanto's strategy to make it more and more difficult to get those documents out to the public. I believe that um, Monsanto deliberately stamped non-confidential documents confidential. It's been very difficult to get those documents decertified, but we've got a fair amount of them decertified. And those documents that are decertified, we can share with you and, in fact, are sharing with you. Some of them we've given to Carrie and she's put on her website. Some are also on our website. And some of them I've brought with me that are available in my PowerPoint presentation. So the decertified documents are available to the public to review. The rest of the documents are not, and I cannot share them with you. Not only can I not share the documents themselves, I cannot talk about the content of the uh, documents that remain confidential. So I'm pretty sure that Monsanto has something like 50 to 100 lawyers for every one of us because I can certainly feel the weight of their lawyers on my shoulders as we go forward in the litigation. In any event, once those documents were produced to us, they became known as the Monsanto Papers in, comp in uh, combination with some documents that we received from Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act requests. So that's how the Monsanto Paper documents came to be. The status of the litigation currently is Monsanto made a motion in the federal court to bifurcate the trial, which means literally split the trial into two different parts. Their argument is that they didn't believe that we had sufficient evidence, sufficient, sufficient qualified evidence to even take the case to a jury. And so what that means, there's a Supreme Court case called the Daubert case, came out uh, about 10 years ago. There's been a flurry of cases subsequently identifying and examining what the meaning of the Daubert case means. But for our purposes, it basically says to the federal judge, you will be the gatekeeper you will not let every piece of evidence in before the jury. In the old days, um, and I've been practicing law almost 40 years, so I remember the good old days, you could, if a, you were a medical doctor, your medical doctor could testify about almost anything. It's not that way anymore. Now you have to be extremely qualified. You don't have to be technically published in the area, but the judges look very carefully at that. So. Then they have what is called a Daubert hearing. The purpose of the Daubert hearing is for the judge to look not so much at the opinions of the experts, but the methodology, the way they arrived at those opinions. Is the way that they arrived at those opinions scientifically acceptable both within the medical community, the scientific community, and the academic community? Is the particular expert that testifying, is he, uh, has he or she published in the area? Things like that. So when the judge bifurcated the, hear the trial, he said, we're only going to look for now at what we call general causation, which is similar to hazard assessment. Hazard assessment is what uh, IARC did. A hazard assessment basically determines, is the product capable of causing the particular result? So in our case, it means are glyphosate-based formulations like Roundup capable of causing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? That's general causation, and it's similar to a hazard assessment. The second step is what we call specific causation, and it's more similar to risk assessment, which is what EPA and EFSA do. In other words, 
now that you've determined that, generally speaking, Roundup can cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the next question is, did it cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in this individual uh, plaintiff? And that's similar to risk assessment in the sense that risk assessment is how much of this particular product is required, what's the level at which you can actually develop non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, what's the risk, and in specific uh, causation, what exactly happened. So once the trial was split in half, we're only dealing with general causation right now. That is, again, can Roundup cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? There will be a Daubert hearing on December 11th in federal court in San Francisco. I invite any of you that want to come to it. The judge has not given us a lot of detail yet as to what, how he's going to handle it. I'm assuming it will be public, but do check on that beforehand because there's been a lot of surprises in this case. So I can't promise you that it will be public, although generally they are. So we just completed last Friday, right before I came here, the depositions of our experts and the experts of Monsanto. In other words, I defended our experts against Monsanto's questionings and cross-examination, and then we cross-examined Monsanto's experts. Um, I've given up a long time ago trying to predict what a judge will do in any given litigation or any given issue, but I feel very, very confident that we will win the Daubert hearing, that the judge will sustain that we have general causation, and that we will then be allowed to go forward. So I don't expect the judge to actually rule mm -hmm. from the bench, meaning giving a speaking opinion, but I think before Christmas we'll have a written opinion from our judge defining that we do in fact have general causation and that we have sufficient, we have proven sufficient evidence through our medical and scientific evidence to go forward to the jury. At that point, uh, we will be requesting trial dates, we will be requesting further discovery. The discovery that we've done so far and what has been produced in the Monsanto papers, remember, is limited to the general causation question. So when we get past general causation and the judge completely opens up the discovery to everything, then we'll get more into the liability phase. We'll be looking at what the sales pitches are that Monsanto made, um, all kinds of other evidence. So remember, when you look at the Monsanto papers now, what you're seeing is very limited in two regards. First of all, it's limited in the way that I, my documents are limited, only general causation only documents that are relevant to that. And secondly, yours is limited more in that you're only seeing documents that have been de-designated. I've seen documents that are still stamped confidential, but they're still limited only to general causation. So we expect if we win, assuming we win the Daubert motion, that we will have another document dump, large one, that we'll then sift through. And when I say document dump, I mean that literally. Again, in the old days, the response of defendants was to try and limit, limit, limit the documents, produce as little as they could. We used to argue about what exactly was responsive to the questions. The way it's handled now is they'll do a giant document dump. Dump. They'll fill this building with documents and say, go find what you're looking for. And every time we say, well, what about this specific question? It's in there. Go find it. You can imagine what that's like. And you can also, I'm sure, imagine that Monsanto did not give us the best search terms or the best search machines possible. But in any event, we're doing that. So remember also, the document dump, these documents that you're seeing are documents that we've culled through and pulled out that we think are important. So um, in terms of trial dates, there is a trial date in June of next year in a California state court. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in court and asked for another trial setting conference. So on November 2nd, I think it is, we'll be asking for another trial date. So we expect to have several trial dates next year, probably beginning in the summer. I'm not sure yet where we'll be in terms of the federal court, but you can anticipate the trial starting sometime next year. So I think that pretty much covers in a very, very general way the status of the litigation. I want to talk just a little bit about uh, how Monsanto is ha handling everything and the way I see the, the litigation. In general, what Monsanto has done is way back, everyone talks about everything beginning with IARC, but actually it began far before that. In 1985, the EPA, our federal regulatory agency, Environmental Protection Agency, classified glyphosate as category C, meaning possibly human carcinogen, meaning it's 
possible that it causes cancer in humans. That was based on a kidney tumor study that was done in animals, in, in rodents, okay? So what you would hope a good company would do when they receive information that their product is a possible human carcinogen is they would investigate, do other studies, look at it and say, try to determine, is my product, in this case, is Roundup causing cancer? But that's not what Monsanto does, did, and that's not what they've done throughout. For the last 30 years, their attitude has been every time anything comes out, whether it's from a regulatory agency or from a medical or scientific body, attack, attack, attack. Destroy, destroy, destroy. They took the kidney tumor study and attacked it and tried to say it wasn't done, the study wasn't done properly, the pathologists that reviewed it don't know what they're doing, we're going to go get our own pathologist EPA and we're going to have them review it. And before their pathologist even looked at the biopsies, they already were sending memos and emails around saying, don't worry, we got this covered and our pathologists are going to say that it's not statistically significant and that it doesn't show that Roundup causes cancer in mice. And lo and behold, what a surprise, they found an extra tumor in the control group, and then all of a sudden it's not statistically significant. And without going into the lengthy details, the next thing we know is glyphosate, which had been categorized as category C, possibly human, human yeah, possible human carcinogen is now classified as category E, meaning no evidence of carcinogenicity. That's the kind of thing they've done over and over again. So it didn't just start with IARC. It started back that we know of. It may have even started sooner, but that I'm aware of it started in 1984 with the kidney tumor study and then 1985 with the category C classification. And that has been the standard Monsanto MO, modus operandi, since the beginning. Another example that Carrie alluded to is Dr. Seralini. He's a French scientist. He also did a rodent study, and I don't know, some of you may have seen the results of his study or seen his publication with the horrible pictures of tumors in rodents. And if you've seen it, you can imagine that Monsanto could not let that study sit around. So not only did they attack the study, they attacked Dr. Seralini personally, made his life miserable. They knew the journal editor uh, of the journal in which it was published, and they got the journal editor to withdraw the, the scientific article. Now, there are very specific, I'm sure as journalists you know, once something is published and has been reviewed, peer reviewed by people that have uh, medical and scientific experts that have looked at it and said this paper is appropriate for publication, it's very difficult to get it withdrawn. And there's very specific grounds under which medical articles can be withdrawn. Basically, it's only for fraud. They didn't even bother, Monsanto and their people didn't even bother to allege fraud on the Sarah Leaning paper because they knew the journal editor, they got the journal editor to withdraw the paper. Now the paper has been republished in another journal, but it always has this cloud over it and we can't really even use it as evidence in court anymore because the jury's going to be thinking without knowing the story, well, why did it get withdrawn? What's wrong? There's something wrong with this paper. There's something wrong with this research. And there's another, art, um, another email in which David Saltmiras, who's a uh, toxicologist employed by Monsanto, is having his annual uh, employee review, which is how you go about getting your bonuses and your pay raise. And he's basically bragging that he got the Sarah Leaning paper withdrawn and saying, give me a raise because look what I did. That's the kind of example of how they handle the science. The other way they handle the science is the ghostwriting that Carrie talked about, and I know I don't have time to go into that, but basically what they do is they'll go around and Monsanto will write the paper themselves, and then they'll go to the, a university. Hey, remember that lab we funded for you for 500,000 or a million dollars? We need a paper published. I think you can figure out how that works. And so ghostwriting is something that they do too. And the reason that ghostwriting is important is because in the scientific community, they're looking at the paper and thinking this paper is independent. But it's not. It's Monsanto driven. And we've got documents in the PowerPoint where you can see Monsanto's name is on the original draft of the publication. The name of the toxicologist, for example, Donna Farmer, is on the paper, crossed out the name of Monsanto, cross out the name of their toxicologist. Voila, the paper appears completely independent, no reference to Monsanto. 
So then the scientific community thinks this is independent, but of course it's not. So the ghostwriting is one thing they do. They get people to be peer reviewers for publications. So if a scientific or medical article is submitted that is contrary to Monsanto's products, then the peer reviewer simply says it's not appropriate for publication. It never gets published. Nobody even hears about it. So that's another thing they do is peer review. And then when it comes to EPA, and Carrie alluded to this, and I know we don't have a lot of time to go into it, but it's in the PowerPoints, is they have very good friends at the EPA, and they use those friends in a variety of ways. They use those friends to get EPA to say that Roundup is safe, and they get their friends at EPA to call up their other friends around the world, for example, EFSA. And there's a great uh, slide in there where they talk about uh, EFSA is, we've had a phone call with EFSA and we got it under control, and uh, meaning EFSA is going to come out with the same opinion we want. And also I think the thing you should remember about regulatory agencies is historically what they've looked at to make their scientific review is unpublished, non-peer-reviewed non science. Okay, IARC looks at peer-reviewed science so that you've got this layer of independence uh, in there. So I say to Monsanto, if you have all of this wonderful science showing that your product is safe, why don't you put it on your website? Why don't you make it public instead of saying it's all trade secrets and confidential and you don't want anybody to look at it? Put it on your website and let the world look at it. That's one thing. The second thing is, and there's a, a, a slide also in the PowerPoint presentation talking about testing of the formulation. That's probably the final way I have time to talk about that they control the science, and that is they don't do the science. There's a great slide in there where their senior toxicologist, Donna Farmer, says, don't go around. She, she, they were asked questions. Monsanto was asked questions about the safety and the carcinogenicity of Roundup. And she says, internally, of course, but we now have it through the discovery process, she says, don't go around saying it's not carcinogenic. Don't go around saying it's safe. We can't say that because we haven't tested the formula, the formula being Roundup. Remember, glyphosate is one of the main active ingredient in um, Roundup, and glyphosate is what I are uh, classified as 2A. But there's a whole formulation that contains all kinds of other ingredients in there, including things called surfactants. Surfactants are used to, uh, in weeds and plants to basically make the uh, surface larger and help increase the entry of the glyphosate into the plant. So the surfactants are not just non-active ingredients, particularly POEA and NGs, which you'll see in the slide, so are also help increase the carcinogenicity, and some of them on their own are carcinogen carcinogenic, meaning they're capable of causing cancer. So Donna Farmer is saying, the chief toxicologist is saying, don't go around saying it's safe because we haven't tested the formulation. And then you see a series of emails and memos saying, and we're not going to test it. And we all know why they're not going to test it. And also when they do do testing, they don't do it long enough. Uh, testing for cancer, there's a latency period which you have to investigate. Um, it's not, you can't do a, an acute testing, which is quick, short. You have to do chronic testing because cancer takes a long time to develop. I'm guessing I'm way out of time. So I'm out of town. I wonder if there's anything else you want me to yeah, discuss. Because there was a question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bon après euh, ces deux exposés euh, qui vous montrent un peu quelle est la situation. Enfin, on s'en doutait un peu. Euh, par rapport à, à l'image que peut avoir Monsanto, euh, même en Europe, avec de nombreux films. Et je salue la présence de Marie-Monique Robin, qui est ici. Euh, juste pour information, elle passe son film ce soir au Parlement européen, à 18h30. Hein, euh, donc c'est le round-up face, au, au, face à ses juges. Et justement, il y aura toute une série d'informations sur le rôle du glyphosate, qui n'est pas seulement cancérigène. Hein. Euh, voilà, des questions Oui. Thomas Friedrich, German journalist. A lot of Thomas Friedrich, German journalist. A lot of overwhelming information from your side. Just I want to clarify a technical question, what you mentioned. Uh, 
category C uh, classification of class, what, what does it mean? Second question would be, can you give us uh, figures about the turnover of glyphosate, uh, uh, Monsanto uh, business? And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, as you already said, it's, it's a saga. Where will there be an end on the, uh, among the lawyers and judges in, in the US who, who will be uh, crucial for the rest of the world, I suppose? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, category C is uh, EPA categorizes pesticides and other products into various categories uh, with strict definitions. Category C simply means that it is a possible human carcinogen, meaning you should go and <coughs> investigate. Carcinogen, capable of can causing cancer. Okay, that's, I think that answers the first one. The second one, with, uh, we currently have, our law firm now has over 4,000 individual cases. I think there's something like over 10,000 individual plaintiffs around the country with the other law firms. We are getting hundreds of new cases uh, every month. Remember, every single case, I have limited it. I, I'm the one that made the decision to limit it to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because I feel that initially we have to show what exactly what we can prove in a court of law and also what we can have the capacity to take on. It's enough to take on Monsanto with regard to one specific cancer. But there, I anticipate that at some day the litigation will expand greatly. There will probably, there's all kinds of other associations with Roundup uh, and with glyphosate in terms of Parkinson disease, in terms of reproductive toxicity, things like that. But for now, every case is somebody who developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or they have a deceased uh, relative that developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, as a result of their use of Roundup. And so there's 10,000 of them now growing every month. Uh, the, in terms of the trial, the trial, the state court trial case that is set for June, if that ends up being the first trial case, it will probably be a trial, um, I don't know this judge very well, so some judges are very good at limiting it, uh, and it shouldn't be, in my opinion, shouldn't be more than a month. Other judges, not so good, it could be two or three month trial. But I anticipate that we'll start getting verdicts, you know, sometime in the fall of next year. Uh, notoriously, the first cases are often continued, the trial date. So I say that's the trial date, and optimistically, that's what we would like. But Monsanto is fighting us on the trial dates. They do not want trial dates. Uh, in fact, two or three weeks ago, I was in court and asked the judge, uh, told the judge the case was at issue, requested a trial date. Uh, Monsanto went ballistic on me. Uh, they did not want the trial date. So it got set for a hearing November 2nd to decide whether or not we're entitled to a trial date. So we're being fought by Monsanto a lot on the trial dates. Trial dates do get continued even after they're set. But we're very hopeful that we'll have a result from our first trial next year. Oui, bonjour. Donc, Marie-Monique Robin, je suis l'auteur du Monde sur le Monsanto et du prochain film et livre, le Roundup face à ses juges. Moi, j'ai une question parce que ma grande inquiétude, bon, ce, que, ce qui est décrit là, ils ont fait la même chose pour les PCB, Monsanto, hein, exactement pareil. La même chose pour euh, l'hormone de croissance laitière, la même chose pour le 2,4-D. Donc, il n'y a rien de nouveau, malheureusement. Hein. Mais moi, mon inquiétude, c'est que Bayer euh, a l'intention de racheter, annoncer le rachat euh, de Monsanto. Et euh, moi, en tant, que, en tant que marraine du tribunal international Monsanto, nous avons adressé une lettre à la commissaire en charge de la concurrence euh, ici. Parce que si nous prenons l'exemple de Bhopal, euh, Union Carbide a, a, a été racheté par euh, Dow Chemicals. Et aujourd'hui encore, les victimes n'ont que leurs yeux pour pleurer parce que le rachat a permis la dissolution euh, juridique de Union Carbide. Donc moi, je pense que si Monsanto a accepté, il y a un deal, enfin c'est mon interprétation, mais c'est une question que j'adresse aux députés euh, et aussi à l'avocate que vous êtes. Quand Monsanto aura disparu, quid de ces procès qui finiront, pour moi, dans les oubliettes de l'histoire Donc il faudrait anticiper, messieurs les députés, et interpeller la Commission européenne. Si vous acceptez ce mariage, qu'est-ce qui va se passer avec la responsabilité légal de Monsanto, parce que tout indique dans l'histoire qu'elle disparaît totalement et que les procès n'ont plus aucune raison d'être. 
ils sont enterrés. Voilà. Yeah. From my point of view, I, that's not going to happen in this case. It's, it's, it's because Bayer is such a large company and because they have plenty of funds and because also Monsanto has plenty of funds, I don't anticipate that being an issue in this litigation. I, I do understand that, but I'm actually really not concerned. But we'll, I mean, we'll see. But you know, I don't well, anticipate that being a problem, and they will still hold Monsanto responsible. Yeah, I mean, what, we've seen what we've seen in the past, you know, Monsanto had some pretty heavy liabilities, um, and w in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and what it did is it essentially went through another merger, spun off those liabilities into a separate company called Solutia, um, and Solutia then held all the legal liabilities, and then they took it into bankruptcy, of course, but... But the, right. Yes, you're right. Yes. They would be very strategic about it. Because they went into bankruptcy. You're not right. Yeah. Yeah. Bon. Yeah. You have to be very non mais c'est une très bonne question parce que effectivement comme il y a la fusion n'est pas faite mais euh, elle va se faire euh, vous savez que on a écrit à madame à la commissaire Vestager pour lui demander de faire une enquête parce que pour nous c'est quand même une brevetabilité du vivant à tous les niveaux hein, puisqu'il y aura les semences il y aura les pesticides et même les médicaments pour soigner les malades bon euh, mais il faut qu'on mette cette partie, et donc on doit la rencontrer, cette commissaire, euh, par rapport au problème de la responsabilité. Parce que c'est vrai que euh, Dao Chemical, après, a dit euh, « ben, moi, je ne suis plus responsable de ce qu'il avait fait, fait. ». Et, et, et dans le cas de Solucha aussi, dans l'histoire de Monsanto, ils ont organisé la faillite de Solucha pour ne pas avoir à payer ensuite. Donc mmh. ils sont très très malins. Mmh. Donc mmh. je veux dire, c'est à vous aussi d'interpeller sur ce point-là, oui, oui, parce qu'ils mmh. euh, savent très bien faire pour échapper euh, mmh. à leurs responsabilités. Et moi, je crains fort, je ne suis pas la seule, je parle au, au nom d'un collectif de juridique, hein, là, euh, on, a, on a adressé, il y a Arnaud Apothécaire à côté de moi, on a adressé une, deux lettres à la commissaire européenne. Quid de ça, parce que toute l'histoire montre que c'est comme ça que ça marche. Okay, I was going to start with the same question, actually, so uh, I'll, I'll try and follow up with something else. Um, I, it's, it's, it's related, actually. I mean, you're, you're ho there's going to be a hearing in the uh, Agriculture Committee, and you've, you've said quite clearly that you want a committee of inquiry looking into Monsanto's activities as a company and possibly separate from the issue of the reauthorization of glyphosate, which is you know, we, we, we're waiting to see what happens there. There's, there should be a meeting of the standing committee in October, as I understand it. But do, with the merger in the background of one of Germany's largest, you know, multinational companies taking over Monsanto, and given the sway that Germany holds in the European Council and, and EU lawmaking as a whole, do you feel that that's going to impa impact in some way on the, on the proce process for reauthorizing glyphosate? Is that, is that a concern? Je, je vais répondre là-dessus. Euh, pourquoi une commission d'enquête Parce qu'il y a deux niveaux. Il y a le niveau actuel où il y a une décision qui doit être prise par la commission avant décembre 2017. Voilà, il y a le coup près avant décembre 2017. Donc là, euh, s'il y a une commission d'enquête, ça ne répondra pas à ça. Nous, on fait pression aujourd'hui. S'il y a cette conférence de presse aujourd'hui, c'est pour faire une pression au niveau des États membres pour qu'ils votent contre l'autorisation du glyphosate. Bon. Euh, ça, c'est... Euh, vous avez vu, la France va dire non. Euh, en Allemagne, on ne sait pas ce que ça va être. Euh, le Danemark, la Suède vont voter contre. Mais euh, l'Italie hein, vont voter contre. Bon. S'il y a un vote... Bon. Euh, et après, il y a une autre réunion qui est, euh, euh, qui est à peu près indiquée au mois de novembre. Et... Soit la commission décide de dire eh « ben, on reconduit ». Peut-être qu'ils vont faire comme ils ont fait euh, lorsque le Parlement les avait saisis en 18 mois. Peut-être qu'ils vont dire « on va le reconduire ». On ne sait pas. 
Ça, c'est une stratégie. Deuxième stratégie, commission d'enquête, c'est des dysfonctionnements. On ne peut faire une commission d'enquête que s'il y a des dysfonctionnements de nos autorités européennes. Et là, c'est l'agence européenne qui est attaquée. Et je dirais même la commission, puisque la commission, après, suit ou pas la vie euh, scientifique. Si on a un dysfonctionnement de l'EFSA, c'est-à-dire que l'EFSA prend un rapport du BFR qui est truffé, si vous voulez, de copier-coller des entreprises, notamment le Glyphosate Task Force et cette plateforme d'entreprise, et qu'il ne mentionne même pas que dans des études académiques, qui fait les commentaires, c'est les consultants et les experts de Monsanto. Vous imaginez qu'à partir du moment où il n'y a plus confiance au niveau des agents, ça ne peut pas fonctionner comme ça. Et l'intérêt d'une commission d'enquête, ce n'est pas d'attaquer Monsanto. L'intérêt d'une commission d'enquête, c'est de dénoncer des dysfonctionnements quand nos agences doivent donner des avis objectifs sur les substances chimiques ou n'importe quel autre problème. Et notamment, on va faire des recommandations. Comment se fait-il que dès demain, si on modifiait le règlement intérieur de toutes nos agences européennes, que ce soit l'EFSA, que ce soit l'ECA ou d'autres, on pourrait dire, regardez le règlement intérieur du cirque, tout doit être publié, open access. Pourquoi nous, les, les Européens on accepte que 70 études, parce qu'elles ont été faites par des industriels et qu'il y a cette directive secret d'affaires, on les prend en compte, sachant qu'on ne peut pas les publier. Ça va à l'encontre de ce que disait Juncker sur la démocratie et la transparence. Donc s'il y a une volonté politique, eh ben, dès demain, on peut dire, eh ben, toutes ces études, vous avez dépensé des millions d'euros, soit, mais on ne les prend pas en compte parce qu'elles ne peuvent pas être publiées. Qui interdit de faire ça Personne. Donc vous voyez bien que ça, c'est un problème de volonté politique et de proposition. Et moi-même, en tant que scientifique, je suis quand même très inquiète dans ce que j'entends sur le fonctionnement des sciences. Nous, les écologistes, on est pour les sciences, mais des sciences où tout est mis sur la table et où on peut regarder les études académiques, les autres études, etc. Si à l'heure actuelle, on accepte que ce sont des multinationales qui prennent le pouvoir, qui achètent des experts. Remarquez, ça s'est toujours fait. Moi, je vois dans les laboratoires pharmaceutiques, c'est pareil. Mais on peut le dénoncer parce qu'on demande la transparence et il de... y a des sanctions à la clé. Même nos commissaires, d'ailleurs, quand on dit, vous euh, voyez, sur le, euh, le turnover des commissaires, on se bagarre pour qu'il y ait des règles du jeu qui soient respectées et des sanctions à la clé. S'il n'y a pas ça, alors ça veut dire quoi ça veut dire que nos agents sont pourris, ça veut dire qu'elles peuvent être achetées, et en plus, elles vont donner des avis, ou le commissaire va reprendre ses avis. On ne peut pas fonctionner comme ça. Surtout lorsqu'on croit en l'Europe, surtout qu'on a envie d'avoir une Europe protectrice, justement, sur la santé. Donc voilà pourquoi, si vous voulez, on monte au créneau là-dessus, parce que ça dépasse le cas du glyphosate. Vous voyez, demain, ça va être sur n'importe quelle molécule, on se pose des questions, alors... Alors, euh, l'industrie, regardez sur les, la définition des perturbateurs endocriniens, cette dérogation qui a été mise en disant « Ah, mais quand on fait un pesticide qui est prévu pour faire un, un perturbateur endocrinien, on doit l'accepter pour tuer les, les insectes. » Non, mais on est où Voilà. C'est vraiment, si vous voulez, pour euh, réguler, c'est ça notre rôle de député européen, c'est on est des législateurs, donc on doit avoir des agences qui fonctionnent, et on doit montrer quelle est la part des politiques et la part du privé. Pour l'instant, le privé est en train de prendre le dessus. Et là, on a eu tous les éléments de preuve pour montrer qu'ils prennent le dessus. Mais avec notre complicité. C'est là où nous, en tant que politiques, on dit non. Merci. Parlons du chantier européen. On n'attend pas du tout euh, une décision dans le comité euh, d'agriculture euh, pour le 5-6 octobre à cause des élections en Allemagne. En Allemagne, on est, on est juste en train d'apprendre qu'il y aura une, une coalition euh, tripartite, ça veut dire euh, on, dit, on parle de Jamaïka avec les Verts. Quand, 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 quand les Verts euh, sera euh, dans une coalition avec Merkel, ça veut dire une chose, euh, Clifosate ne euh, va pas être approuvé euh, du gouvernement de l'Allemagne. La France a déjà décidé euh, avec Mme euh, euh, Hollande euh, à ce stade et, et juste hier, le Premier ministre a confirmé euh, à la fin du 2018 qu'il n'y aura 
pas de glyphosate plus euh, sur le marché euh, en France. Comme ça, j'aimerais bien savoir euh, votre attente et vos, euh, votre expectation concernant euh, le, le fait de votre, de votre audition le, le 11 octobre. Deuxièmement, il faut aussi rappeler que la Commission européenne a, a, a tablé une proposition sur euh, le processus, le, le régime euh, de la com comitologie, parce qu'eux, ils veulent plus que les pays membres euh, euh, votent abstention et à la fin, c'est la Commission qui, euh, qui, qui doit décider, parce que euh, ni Juncker ni Martin Seelmeier n'aiment plus euh, cette procédure-là. Euh, qu est -ce que, euh, quelle est votre euh, idée et votre opinion sur euh, la proposition de la Commission européenne euh, concernant la comitologie Merci. Je vais répondre moi sur la France et l'Allemagne. Bon, pour l'Allemagne, effectivement, s'il y a une coalition à la Jamaïque, avec les libéraux et les verts, euh, on va tout faire pour que... Oui, ça s'appelle comme ça, ça fait noir, jaune et vert. Bon. Euh, ça met un peu... Hein, D'arc-en-ciel, bon. Multiculturel. Multiculturel, oui. Effectivement, on va pousser pour que les Verts aient une influence sur Mme Merkel, qui avait déclaré qu'elle était pour l'autorisation du glyphosate, je vous signale, d'où l'intérêt des coalitions, pour que les Verts fassent pression pour pas que ça se fasse. Mais on n'en est pas là, parce que le gouvernement n'est toujours pas fait. Et vu le positionnement des libéraux vis-à-vis -vis de l'Europe, bon, j'attends de voir. Donc ça, pour moi, c'est point d'interrogation. Mais c'est vrai que là, les Verts vont jouer là-dessus. Pour la France, c'est un peu plus compliqué, parce que il euh, y a des divergences de pensée. Euh, de la part de Nicolas Hulot, et pas de Madame Hollande, hein, Nicolas Hulot, euh, Nicolas Hulot a déclaré euh, « On votera contre l'autorisation des glyphosates ». Mais contre, pour nous, ça voulait dire, quelle que soit la durée. On vote contre, on n'est pas d'accord, le glyphosate, il a été suffisamment informé, c'est cancérigène, antibiotique, est-ce que vous La déclaration du ministère de l'Agriculture et du Premier ministre est de dire, on votera contre l'autorisation pour 10 ans. Donc ça veut dire qu'il laisse un compromis possible. Et la deuxième chose qu'ils ont déclaré, c'est de dire on va faire un plan sans indiquer de date pour diminuer la quantité de pesticides utilisés par les agriculteurs. Je vous signale qu'il y a une étude qui vient de sortir de l'INRA qui montre que si on diminue de 50% l'utilisation du glyphosate, ça ne change rien sur les rendements agricoles. Et puis, j'ai reçu une lettre, moi, de la FNSEA qui me dit sans glyphosate, on ne peut rien faire. Enfin, bon, vous voyez, ça... C'est très franco-français, mais on voit bien que entre le Premier ministre et le ministère de l'Environnement, ils ne sont pas tout à fait sur le même diapason. Bon. Et ils ne donnent pas de date en plus. Hein. Parce que vous savez qu'on connaît les Français, nous, comme les Allemands connaissent les Français. On dit on va faire ça et puis on voit que ça ne marche pas. Bon. Ça, c'est une première chose. 11 octobre, on s'attend à quoi On avait invité Monsanto qui refuse de venir. Donc euh, il va y avoir... Le BFR, cette agence allemande, ne veut pas venir non plus. Et euh, l'EFSA va être obligé de venir, puisque c'est une agence européenne. Bon. Et donc là, eh ben là, on va tout mettre sur la table en disant euh, ce qu'on a dit, les copier-coller, en disant euh, comment ça se fait que vous envoyez des rapports. Euh, ça me fait penser, vous savez, une fois en France, il y a eu un scandale sur un médicament qu'on appelle le Mediator. Il y a une sénatrice qui, a, qui était responsable du rapport. Eh ben, avant que le rapport sorte publiquement, elle avait envoyé le rapport à Servier, qui était, vous voyez, coupable d'avoir mis euh, sur le marché ce médicament pour savoir si tout était conforme. Eh bien, vous voyez, l'EFSA, ça me fait penser à la même chose. Il envoie au consultant de, du Glyphosate Tax Force pour dire est-ce que euh, tout est correct euh, Bon, on ne va pas être attaqué, quoi. Voilà. Donc, euh, ce qu'on s'attend, si vous voulez, c'est d'informer les députés européens pour qu'ils fassent aussi pression vis-à-vis -vis de leurs États membres pour dire mais c'est euh, le glyphosate, ce qu'a fait l'EFSA, c'est de la science manipulée, tronquée, euh, euh, falsifiée. Et c'est pas possible d'accepter ça. Donc, vous voyez, ça a un enjeu sur le fonctionnement de nos institutions. Bon. Maintenant, comitologie. Yes, on uh, comitologie, that was uh, the proposal of the Commission on, in February uh, this year, I think. Where indeed, as you, as you say, um, 
Juncker and his uh, chef de cabinet are very annoyed about um, what is happening now. If we talk about comitology, we not only talk about glyphosate, we talk also about the authorizations of GMOs, that kind of things. Uh, I want to remind that Juncker said in his uh, inauguration speech in, in July 2014 that he wanted to democratize the decision-making process on GMOs, has, has, is linked with uh, the comitology uh, procedure. There have been efforts of the Commission uh, on GMOs, if I talk about GMOs, to renationalize uh, the decision-making process. Uh, we have it in cultivation uh, with the change of the regulation, with the, of the directive of 2001. There was a proposal, or there is a proposal of the Commission uh, on the import of GMOs, which has been voted uh, uh, down by Parliament very clearly. And it is still on the tables of the on the table of the council. But what I hear from there is that no one wants to uh, adopt uh, or to 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 validate uh, the the proposal of the commission. So there they they have a, uh, the whole decision is a, is a dead is deadlocked. Uh, the same on glyphosate. Uh, they they know very well that. Um, a qualified majority in favor of the authorization will be extremely difficult. And that is why they came up with uh, that uh, comitology uh, proposal, whereby there are many parts in, in the proposal, but one of the parts is indeed uh, forcing the member states to not uh, abstain anymore, which is, um, which is a very difficult issue also in, in, in the Council of Ministers, we are here in Belgium, where the, the regions are competent for uh, those kind of decisions, where uh, by Flanders has a completely different position than the French-speaking part of this country. Uh, that is why Belgium abstains often in that kind of discussions. How can you force Belgium to vote in favor or against if the competent authorities in Belgium do not agree? An abstention is part of a decision-making process. You have, the, you have to have the right to, to abstain. Now, on the procedure, um, in, in, uh, in the Parliament, I am the shadow in the Environmental Committee. Um, we didn't start uh, working on this file yet. And what I hear from uh, the people uh, and my links in the Council of Ministers is that that in fact the proposal is dead in the council, that they never ever will validate the proposal of, of the commission. I think here the commission follows the, the wrong path to solve a problem uh, and, and whereby they ignore the imminent fact that in many um, decisions there is clearly no majority, nor in the parliament, nor in the council of ministers to validate uh, their proposals. And if you want to democratize the decision-making process, you should take into account majorities. Uh, certainly in the European Parliament, where by all my objections on GMOs and the import of G GMOs and the cultivation of GMOs, our um, objections are voted with two-third majorities. So two-thirds of the European Parliament say no import of GMOs, no cultivation of new uh, uh, GMOs. Uh, if the Commission would be serious, they would listen to the Parliament. Merci à vous. Et il y a un petit café, oui, pour euh, discuter. Mais vous, les journalistes, on joue un jeu important, là. Hein. Soit euh, ça diffuse... Et on peut modifier l'opinion. <rire>